It's in our own interest, they say, to see that communist regimes remain reasonably stable. If they need wheat or other agricultural commodities, send it to them. If they need industrial know-how, invite their scientists and engineers to tour our factories so they can learn how best to produce. If they still can't manufacture the goods they need, then send our own people over there to build their plants and set up their production lines. If that doesn't work, then sell the products to them on easy credit terms and don't really expect to get paid. In fact, if they need money, give that to them too. Give them anything they need so they won't become restless and aggressive. And yes, as harsh as it may seem on the surface, it's even in our best interest to see that communist regimes can successfully put down internal anti-communist revolts. Now, none of this because we're pro-communist. Only because we're mature, objective, intelligent people who recognize that in this modern nuclear age, we can't afford the risk to our own survival, which would be inherent in having so powerful an adversary struggling defensively to maintain his position. All right, we're ready now for the final step in the grand design, which concerns itself with the question of realistic, attainable goals. What is the best we can hope to achieve in this new age with all of its complexities? How do we resolve this dilemma before we all go up in a mushroom cloud of nuclear dust? The answer that is offered to us is this. We should encourage the communist world gradually to move toward us, ideologically, politically, and economically, while at the same time, we must be willing to move toward them, ideologically, politically, and economically, to the point where, hopefully, in the not-too-distant future, we'll be able to merge our system with theirs, and, of course, with those of the rest of the world, to form some kind of a world brotherhood, a world union, a world government, to be exact, which, by definition, would hold a monopoly over all these weapons of mass destruction, and then nuclear war between nations finally would be impossible for the simple reason that there no longer would be any nations, including our own. There would remain only a group of disarmed political subdivisions of an all-powerful world government. Of course, the grand designers scoff at the suggestion that such a concentration of power in one place might ideally be suited for a total consolidation of control into the hands of a small group of power-hungry world politicians. They particularly scoff at the possibility of this power falling into communist hands through the tactics used so successfully by their agents working within every other coalition government in which they've ever participated. We're assured that since this would be a world coalition government, for that reason the communists wouldn't try to seize power they'd be content merely to share in it. Well, without going into that particular little fantasy, just for the sake of discussion, let's grant the point and assume that a world coalition government with the communists really would result in a merger of our systems rather than the domination of theirs over ours. What then? Well, first of all, we would have to be willing to give up certain things that we would rather retain, such as our sovereignty and our independence. In other words, we must be willing to abide by the political dictates of the majority of other nations. One man, one vote in a world democracy. We must merge our monetary system with those of other nations, eventually to form a world currency. Conference could see plenty of finger pointing, as you can imagine. Many European leaders are placing the blame for the global economic crisis on the United States and a lack of regulation specifically on Wall Street. Now, this could present a major roadblock in global trade deals, as the World Trade Organization predicts a 10% drop this year already without some of these tensions. In the meantime, Pope Benedict the 16th, he's also weighing in, calling for G8 leaders to create a new world financial order. Pope Benedict XVI is calling for a new world financial order. In the third encyclical of his pontificate, Benedict denounced the profit-at-all-cost mentality of the globalized economy. 
and he lamented that greed brought about the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression. The document, entitled Charity and Truth, was released just hours before the G8 summit gets underway in Italy. We have seen the consequences of uh, a globalization where the market has to find by itself the regulations and the rules. And we have seen the disaster that has been over the last uh, year. The pot of stress that he is not opposed to a globalized economy, saying that if done correctly, it has unprecedented potential to redistribute wealth around the world. But he did warn if globalization continues on the current path, modern societies risk increased poverty, inequality, and further environmental damages. I think that for sure the Pope thinks that globalization without a soul and without a link with veritas, with truth, uh, is at a high risk. Mark Hamrick, The Associated Press. We must willingly submit all international disputes to a world supreme court. A new threat tonight to this country's judiciary system and our national sovereignty. All thank you to the World Court. The World Court is now demanding the United States halt the executions of uh, more than 50 Mexican citizens now on death row. The first of those scheduled executions is uh, that of an illegal alien gang member convicted of the rape and murder of two young teenage girls. Lisa Sylvester has our report. The International Court of Justice in The Hague ordered the United States to take all measures necessary to ensure five Mexican nationals on death row in the U.S. are not executed pending the World Court's decision on their cases. One of them, Jose Medellin, was convicted of brutally raping and killing two Texas teens. He's scheduled to be executed in Texas on August 5th. Mexico brought the case to the international court, saying Medellin and the other Mexican nationals were not told of their right under the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations to contact the Mexican consulate upon arrest. Lawyers representing the government of Mexico in a statement responded to the decision, saying, We are confident the United States and the state of Texas will comply with the ICJ's order and stay the August 5th execution of Mr. Medellin. But the White House did not indicate how it would proceed. ICJ issued a preliminary decision. It's something that we're reviewing now, so I don't have anything more for you on it. Previously, the Bush administration had asked the state courts to give the Mexican nationals new trials. But the U.S. Supreme Court said the White House does not have the authority to compel the states to act. The Washington Legal Foundation represents the family of one of the Texas girls killed. Richard Samp says the World Court can issue any ruling it wants, but from a practical standpoint, it has no real jurisdiction over state criminal matters. There is no other court in the world, no other national court in the world, that has permitted uh, the World Court to second guess its criminal proceedings. So uh, the idea that the United States ought to allow it, it, uh, it to interfere here, I think, is uh, unwarranted. And a short while ago, CNN received a statement from the Texas Attorney General's office in which they stated, quote, Texas is bound not by the World Court, but by the U.S. Supreme Court, which reviewed this matter and determined that the convicted murderer's execution shall proceed. The Texas Attorney General also noted that there have been 15 years of appeals delaying justice for the victim's families. Lou? Lisa, thank you very much. Lisa, so much. The U.S. Supreme Court today heard arguments over the death penalty conviction of an illegal alien from Mexico in the brutal rape and murder of two teenage girls in Texas. The highly unusual case involves President Bush. The president now wants to stop the execution of the Mexican citizen, even though President Bush presided over more than 150 executions while he was governor of the state of Texas. And abide by those decisions, regardless of the outcome. And above all, we must turn over our most powerful weapons and even our armies to international control so that the new world government will possess sufficient military might to compel the various political subdivisions by force, if necessary, to comply with the dictates of its laws and the decrees of its court. Now, to be sure, we'd prefer not to have to do any of these things because, obviously, if we're going to merge with other countries, other cultures, other legal systems and political ideologies. We can't expect the whole world to adopt our way of doing things. It'll be a give and take situation in which we'll have to seek a common denominator, a middle ground between our way of life 
and the way things are done in other parts of the world. And, of course, the result of such a compromise of systems, predictably, would have to be a mixture of the volatile dictatorships of Latin America, the tribal customs of newly emerging Africa, and the socialist regimes of Europe and Asia. Add to this concoction the necessity to absorb the doctrines and methods of communist regimes, and it's rather obvious that we're just going to have to give up certain cherished traditions and customs and learn to adjust to a way of life substantially different from that which we inherited. But it won't be so bad. We'll get used to it, and future generations won't know the difference. Besides, we really don't have any choice in the matter. It's that or the bomb. So let's get on with the job of putting an end to our own nationhood as it has been historically defined. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the men who have formulated this grand design consider themselves to be part of the intellectual elite. In other words, in their opinion, they're just a little smarter than the rest of us. They feel that the average American doesn't quite have the intelligence or the aptitude to understand the wisdom of their grand design. And in this way, the grand designers are confident that the American people will remain satisfied that their leaders are really standing firm and doing all that is humanly possible. But in reality, ladies and gentlemen, they're merely buying time. It's their plan that the old timers among us, those of you who have been raised with those old fashioned and outmoded concepts of patriotism and love of country, that in time, your generation will pass away or at least become the minority voice. And at the same time, they're catching the younger generations coming up through the high schools and the colleges, like they caught me. And the grand designers are confident that in just a few more years, especially if they can lower the voting age, the political majority of the American people can be conditioned to accept the total abandonment of our national sovereignty. If you've been wondering why it is that we can't seem to win any wars against the communists, it's simply because it's our policy not even to embarrass them, much less to defeat them. In 1963, the United States Arms Control and Disarmament Agency financed a report by the Peace Research Institute, published in April of that year. And here is what our tax dollars produced. Whether we admit it to ourselves or not, we benefit enormously from the capability of the Soviet police system to keep law and order over the 200 million Russians and the many additional millions in the satellite states. The breakup of the Russian communist empire today would doubtless be conducive to freedom, but would be a good deal more catastrophic for world order. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, according to the grand design, supposedly it's in our own self-interest for the Soviet police state to remain intact to remain stable and to maintain its death grip over the captive nations. Well, that kind of reasoning leads us next to the pages of one of the most influential newspapers in the world, the New York Times. On August 16, 1961, the Times ran this editorial. We must seek to discourage anti-communist revolts in order to avert bloodshed and war. We must, under our principles, live with evil, even if by so doing we help to stabilize tottering communist regimes and perhaps even expose citadels of freedom to slow death by strangulation. Is that shocking? Well, if you accept the premise of the grand design, it shouldn't be. It's then merely the cold and objective appraisal of our limited alternatives in this nuclear age. Well, let's bring this philosophy now to its ultimate conclusion and see what the world planners have to say about the future role of American sovereignty.